team photographer for the Boston Red Sox. Um, been there since 2012. So I'll talk a lot about what I do with the Red Sox, my role with the team, um, and what goes into making really good sports photography. I'm also a freelance commercial and editorial photographer based in Boston. So you'll see some work for other clients, uh, other types of sports photography, things that I've done. And also kind of touch on social media and how photography fits into the world these days. I understand we have a lot of cell phone photographers on here. So there'll be some, hopefully some takeaways that you can, um, you can grab from this presentation as well. Um, so, you know, with that being said, I'm just going to share my screen real quick and just give me a, give me a thumbs up if we can, uh, if we can see it. We're good. Cool. And then we'll, um, we'll get into it here. So, um, yeah, like I said, I, you know, my, my main role is, is the senior manager of photography for the Boston Red Sox uh, baseball club. Um, I've been there since 2012. I started as a photo intern for the Red Sox um, in 2012, right out of college. Um, I was lucky enough to kind of work my way up um, from there. So, you know, I get a lot of questions about the job and what the job entails. So I'll start with kind of just a high level overview of the different parts of the job and you'll see some, you know, some nice images to, to go with it. So, you know, as the team photographer for any sports team, really, there are four primary roles or responsibilities that, that come with the job. And the first really is to act as a historian for the team. You're, you're there, you know, for better or for worse to shoot and document everything that's happening that's involved with um, with the Red Sox team and Fenway Park as a venue. So, you know, I'm there to shoot all of the, the games at Fenway Park. I travel quite a bit on the road as well for games and, and any sort of player activity that's happening on a day-to-day -day basis, either on the field or away from it. Um, and then throughout the year, you know, there are a couple of special events that I go through, go through every single year to cover down in Florida for spring training for about a month every year. Um, we're based in Fort Myers, Florida for spring training. So the golf side of the state. Um, and then a couple other things throughout the year, there's the all-star game every year in a different city. Um, and, you know, if we're lucky enough, we're in playoff contention and in postseason into October. So covering that as well. Um, and so, you know, just kind of thinking about the role, it's something that you are shooting photos, not just for now, for your marketing needs, for your social media needs for now, but also always keeping in mind that your photos are going to serve as a historical record of the club, of the team, uh, and of the franchise as a whole. And, you know, I went to photojournalism school. I studied journalism in college and grad school. And so I work in a marketing department now. I can't say that I work, you know, as a photojournalist per se. This is marketing, it's public relations, it's making everything look as good as it possibly can be. But that being said, I still try and approach the way I shoot with that journalistic instinct in mind. And so really, you know, that just kind of means telling the stories of the team and telling the stories of the players in any given week. And that's, you know, a lot of that really goes into just paying attention to the storylines surrounding the team, surrounding the subjects and the people that you're photographing every day. So. I know that if a player is having a good week, I should make sure to focus extra on that player. If we just got a new player from another team, I know that I need to get you know that player right away. Um, and when things like this happen, when a fight breaks out, I know that I need to shoot that because that's telling the story of, of what's happening. Um, so baseball is one of those sports where you really know, you never know what you're gonna get every day. And sometimes you do get lucky with kind of crazy, crazy moments like this fight that happened here. Um, and, you know, we're always looking for those good peak action moments. These are the things we all love to see about sports photography, those, you know, peak action moments. But a lot of the job and being able to get those images comes from being able to anticipate the shot or anticipate the play or the moment before it actually happens. And that's a concept that, you know, kind of takes a while to, to perfect and master. Um, but I feel like with any sort of live photography, whether that's sports or music or news, you get, uh, the more you do it and the more repetition you have, the more you get a sense of being able to put yourself in a position to get lucky to get these shots before they actually happen. Because a photo like this happens really quickly in front of your eyes. And if you're not in the right place or pointing your camera at the right place, you're not gonna get you know, a shot like this. So I think you know, generally with photography, having a good knowledge of your subject, whatever it is that you shoot, really goes a long way 
and translating to your pictures. I grew up playing baseball, grew up watching baseball, um, a fan of the game. And I think, you know, that knowledge and background really helps when you're doing sports photography. And then, you know, for me, it's the action is one thing, but I really love these, these great reaction moments, these emotional moments, um, in addition to just what's, what's happening on the field. You know, it's kind of those, those split seconds of, of raw emotion or, or release um, that kind of bring you as the viewer right into the scene, it makes you feel like you're there, like you're a part of the action. And so I love these like walk-off celebrations at the end of the game, these dramatic endings to the games when the whole team is celebrating. These are the kind of pictures that I'm just naturally drawn to. And I try and convey that energy that's happening in the stadium through, through the photos. And a little bit of, you know, kind of what I touched on before, like everything you're seeing here is photos that make our team look great, right? They look, uh, you know, appealing and it looks like a really fun place to be. And that's really my job working as a marketing photographer for an organization like, like a sports team. And so I do have to keep that in mind and that's, that's my primary goal. But the reality of the job is that there are other times where it's not all fun in games and it, is, it does come with some difficulties. You're dealing with uh, you know, high level personalities, in some cases, superstar personalities. Um, and so sometimes the players don't want you to be there. And that's certainly uh, something that I've experienced a lot of times uh, throughout my years there. This is um, Dustin Pedroia, who's one of the greatest players in, in Red Sox history, uh, notorious for just hating the camera. And so the, you know, this is kind of him telling me to basically get out of his face with the camera. Um, so you know, that's, that's part of the, the game too when you're shooting. Um, but going back to kind of the journalistic uh, integrity or journalistic instinct, you know, my, my intuition is to shoot the picture first and then ask questions later. So if it's something like this of our manager getting tossed out of the game or something that represents us in a bad or negative light, as a photographer, I'm still going to shoot that and then we can figure out, okay, are we going to use this picture or is it never going to see the light of day? But basically my motto for sports photography or really anything that's happening live is to just shoot first and then <laughs> ask questions later. You can figure it out. You can figure it out later. Um, and I think, you know, to, to cover your, your team in a way that gives you as the viewer, you know, a unique and exclusive look, exclusive look at, at um, what we're trying to show. I think your success as a photographer really hinges largely on your ability to make and maintain meaningful relationships with the players and the coaches and the staff that are involved with the team on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, a lot of the great shots that you see around sports from team photographers, not just in baseball, but in other sports as well, only happen, those photos only happen because those team photographers took the time and efforts to make those relationships and get themselves to a point where the players trusted them enough to allow them into their lives for things like this. And that is an advantage or just a difference that a team photographer would have versus say a photographer for a newspaper or a newswire who kind of just comes in and shoots the game, you know, arrives an hour before the game, shoots the game and then leaves. You know, we are embedded with these players on a day-to-day -day basis year after year. And so you do have to kind of develop and nurture those relationships. And this is something that is a process. It takes time to build up, um, you know, that level of trust, that level of respect um, from, from those players. And you kind of have to nurture and chip away at this process over time. Um, but once you do kind of get to that point um, and, and you make it, you know, you make it there, you find that those doors really open up and it allows for some, some really incredible access uh, which leads to some some really great storytelling and that's again what, what I'm all about and, and I think that translates to away from the field as well you know for me my personal uh, philosophy on sports photography is it's not just what happens on the field there's so much more to sports than what's just happening between the lines and you know at the Red Sox we really emphasize this um, in kind of showing the players personality you know the team is made up of so many individual unique personalities and so we're trying to showcase that as much as we can in their lifestyle and what they do away from the field. Um, and I think that is just as valuable as the sports photography as if not more valuable. Um, and so, you know, any, any chance that we have to get access to these players away from the field, 
we're all about it. And that's what I'm always trying to carve out and, and seek um, with those relationships that we're able to make. So, um, you know, a couple of quick examples. These are all players that have played through the Red Sox in the past. Um, we did a trip to New York a couple of years ago um, and we had an off day before we played the Yankees the next day. And so the idea was just to try and catch up with as many of the players as we possibly could um, and just shoot whatever they were doing on their off day in New York City. And, you know, basic things that you and I as normal, regular people would do, going shopping, taking a yellow cab, walking through Times Square, going to Central Park, you know, just showing these oftentimes famous uh, high profile athletes just doing the day to day normal things. Um, you know, that, that we would do. Another, you know, quick example is, is from Miami. We were there two winters ago. Uh, yeah, before, before the pandemic, a couple of our players lived down there. So, you know, just go down, see how they live at home, see what their homes look like, see what their workout routine is like in the off season, their family life. We just feel like this gives, this paints much more of a complete picture of our athletes than just, you know, batting and, and swinging and pitching and throwing and running and all that stuff. Um, and, you know, I think it's just super important with, with sports photography or really any type of photography that you're doing, you know, your subjects are humans first and then they're athletes second, you know, they're, they're fathers, they're husbands, um, they've got families, hobbies, things they're into. And so that's kind of our approach. And anytime we can get that access and get that intimate, that level of intimacy, um, I'm all for it. And that's what I think separates us from a lot of the other sports teams um, that, that you'll see. Portraits are also a really big part of, of what we do. Um, every year in Florida, we have what's called Team Photo Day. And basically this is one morning where we send our entire roster of players and coaches through seven or eight different photo and video setups. And it's kind of like an assembly line and this is a chance for us to get photos and video of all of our athletes to last us throughout the entire year. Um, and this is kind of like a crazy two hour window where they're just running through one after the other. And it's like before it's, it's all over and before you know it, it's all over. Um, and so this look has kind of evolved as we've gone on. It started kind of, you know, simple and then kind of gotten more um, intense or involved or creative over the years. And this is fun because this is a chance that we can really get creative and go a little bit crazy with uh, a non-traditional portrait setup or look. So you're just kind of seeing us go through the years here on a couple different, um, couple different types of stylistic. This was like a blueprint abstract of Fenway Park. Um, and then this year we did kind of this like prism look with cools and warm tones. Um, so again, just a, a, a fun opportunity and portraits are a really big part of the photography that a team photographer will do. Um, so just some more examples here. We kind of get crazy with it sometimes. This was done with a projector. So basically, uh, physically, literally projecting an image of the stars onto the side profile of their faces and then using some strobe lights with colored gels on them and com using the combination of the two light sources to kind of make these fun all-star portraits um, to, to promote the all-star game. And then, you know, we have a magazine that comes out a couple times a year, and that's always a great opportunity for an exclusive portrait, an exclusive access piece. Um, and this is usually a great way for guys to get involved. They love hearing that we're going to put their face on the cover of a magazine that's going to be sold to 35,000 people every night. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to, to really do that player marketing and, and athlete access. And then I don't know if we, if we have any people who have been to Fenway Park or spent any time in Boston in this crowd, but um, it is, you know, one of the, the crown jewels of baseball, one of the greatest sports venues that we have in our country um, for all the history that it brings. And so in addition to what happens, you know, to the team, our goal is to showcase all of the beauty and wonder that is, is Fenway Park um, on a nightly basis. Um, and, you know, that's kind of, the, the beauty shots of the stadium, walking around, showing the sunsets, the fans, the atmosphere. Um, I think this is a, a super important part of sports photography and it kind of paints a more complete picture. Um, and I think it's really cool to see night after night how a stadium comes to life. You know, it starts out empty during the day, then the players start to come in, they start to warm up and do practice. Then the gates open and the place fills up and by first pitch, it's totally alive and 
you know, the atmosphere is crazy and then it all kind of dies down again overnight and then the cycle kind of continues. And so I love that kind of repetition and seeing those cycles. And, you know, we get a lot of these type of photos in addition to the action that's happening. And these are used for all kinds of things from, you know, ticketing, um, signage, marketing materials, billboards around the city. This, this kind of Fenway beauty stuff is really valuable for us for marketing for all kinds of materials that, that we use. Um, and we have a luxury because even if we're playing poorly and we have you know, no chance or we have a bad season, people still love coming to Fenway Park as a place to gather. And so we can always fall back on that if, uh, if our team's not doing well. And, you know, I think, you know, the more photos you can show like this, the better you're off you're going to be from an archival perspective. And I think it's interesting to look at photos, like I said before, kind of as a historical record and even kind of ordinary, what might seem like kind of mundane average photos now will take on a whole new life 20, 30, 40 years down the road. Even things that you're not thinking about, the clothing that people wear, the style, the overall look and feel of the ballpark, what the players were wearing, what the players looked like. That's all stuff that we take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis. And when we take pictures, we're not even really thinking about that. But when those photos go into our archive and then you look at them 30, 40 years down the road, they're gonna take on a whole new life. So I'm always trying to keep that in mind, even when I'm shooting something as simple as a meet and greet or a grip and grin, everything that you shoot is a historical record. So hold on to your images because you never know what kind of new life they're gonna take on. As, as time goes on. And, you know, so the days where we've had seven or eight or nine games in a row and I'm kind of feeling creatively exhausted, um, I'll just kind of take a lap around the park and this is a great way to just shoot some different stuff um, and kind of get inspired again. And then, you know, finally we, we are lucky at Fenway that it's, it's kind of expanded beyond baseball at this point. Um, the goal has been to turn the stadium into like an environment where all kinds of events can happen um, and maximizing the ballpark and the space year round. So we've had all kinds of special events at Fenway. And as the team photographer, you kind of become also like the house photographer for the ballpark as a venue. So, you know, we've had things like football here, uh, real football, as you could say, uh, Liverpool soccer um, comes over here every once in a while. Um, kind of this idea that the ballpark can be transformed into, you know, different types of spaces and we get to shoot access, you know, we get access to shoot all that is pretty cool. We have about 10 concerts a year, all different types of acts coming in. This is Steven Tyler from Aerosmith, um, Lady Gaga a couple of years ago. Um, so all kind of different performers. Um, they even put a massive ski and snowboard ramp right down the middle of the field one year. Um, so pretty crazy to see how they, they pack things in. Um, but just kind of the idea that it, it's, be, it's become kind of a hub in Boston. It's a gathering place. It's a place where people meet. So all these elaborate pregame ceremonies where you have celebrities and special guests coming in, that is all part of the job and all part of the responsibility. So we shoot all of it. And not just at the park, but also getting out into the community. Um, our players are great about doing good in the community. There's a lot of visits to hospitals, um, charities, after school clinics, baseball leagues, homeless shelters, things like that. And so I've gotten to witness some really special moments, uh, players making a difference out in the community. And it's, it's really cool to, to see these happen um, day to day. So that's the, that's the level, the high level overview of the job. Um, and I think, you know, with, with photography and especially doing sports photography, gear is naturally a, a part of this, right? And so I'll give you a quick kind of run through of the gear. Um, you know, obviously I think it doesn't, you shouldn't let gear limit you. You don't need fancy cameras, fancy lenses to, to make great pictures. You can do it with a cell phone. You can do it with a basic DSLR or mirrorless camera. But in order to do it at this professional high level for an organization where there's a ton going on and you're shooting every single day, you do need the right tools for the job. So I'll give you the, the, the rundown of what my typical kit would look like um, and, and show you kind of what's involved. Um, we are team Nikon at the Red Sox. We're pretty deep into Nikon. We've been using them for years now. Um, great products. And this is kind of my kit. So I always have 
two, if not three cameras on me at the same time, you know, two over the shoulder, one around the neck um, with varying lenses. So I'm on the D5 and the D6 now. Um, these are cameras that are great for sports action photography. They shoot at 14 frames a second. So that allows us to kind of freeze the action and get those peak action moments. Um, and then there's a variety of lenses. So my bread and butter kind of wide angle lens is a 24 to 70, a very versatile lens for anything that's happening in close range. And then I'll also have a 70 to 200 as kind of my mid range lens, maybe any action that's happening 10 to 30 feet away from me. That's what I'll use the 70 to 200 for. Then you can kind of mix in some of the more artistic lenses, the prime lenses like a 35, one four or an 85. These are really great portrait lenses and also really great behind the scenes lenses um, for those areas like the batting cage, the tunnel, the weight room, players locker room, that type of thing, um, because they're wide open on the aperture and allows you to shoot really well in low light conditions. I always carry a flash on me. You just never know when you're going to get called into some sort of gripping grin or event or get called up to the owner suite to take a photo with a guest. So you always got to kind of be prepared for that at all times. And then we kind of get into the bigger lenses, the more heavy duty sports lenses. Um, the 200 to 400 is a very nice versatile lens. Um, you know, zooms in and out 200 millimeter to 400. So you can just kind of one size fits all lens for sports photography. The 400 is straight through 28 all the way. This is my go to like if I had one sports lens, this would be the lens. Um, and then we'll also mix in the 500 if we want even more push even more oomph, uh, you know, and really, really want to zoom in to, um, you know, to our players. I carry on a monopod just to offset the weight. Um, XQD cards, really fast upload speeds. I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and always have the laptop on, on me as well. Um, social media is, is the name of the game right now. Um, and so this is kind of what our photo pit looks like uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, as you can see, we're, real, we're right in on the action. We're right down on field level. And you can see it's pretty crowded. This is kind of what it looks like. We always have a lot of media interest. Um, and so there's always a lot of photographers and we cram ourselves in pretty tight. Um, it's an intense environment. It's a high energy environment and you really have to be on and paying attention at all times since you are so close to the action. Um, and you see in the foreground, we've all got our laptops there. So that is common practice. We are all filing photos in real time as the game is happening. Um, you know, we have a social media team at the Red Sox that puts out all of our content right away so that you as the viewer can see it kind of as it's happening. And so I'll have my laptop there during the game. And then when there's natural breaks in the game or between innings, I'll be ingesting photos with the card, doing a quick edit, color correct, crop, tone, and then sending them out to social media and then doing our captions and uploading to our archives. So when the thing happens, I'm shooting it and ingesting right away because speed right now is pretty much the entire name of the game. So it's a pretty crazy environment. And this is, this is only ramped up over the past five years or so. It wasn't always this sense of urgency. And so I'll give you kind of a example of the life cycle of a photo and how it happens. Um, this is a, a really great catch that one of our players made a, a few years back. Um, you know, saving a home run from going over the wall. Uh, I got the photo. It was a nice photo. Um, we put it up on our Twitter right away. And for some reason, this photo kind of went viral within minutes of the play happening. It was all over the internet. Um, and, you know, it was just kind of a viral moment. And that led to other outlets picking up the photo. ESPN puts it on their Instagram, for example, a day later other outlets sharing it throughout the weeks. And then a couple of weeks later, it ends up as a full page, um, two page spread in the print edition of Sports Illustrated. So it just kind of shows you when something happens, it's really important to get it out. And then you don't really know where it's gonna go from there, but it has the potential to make waves in all different types of outlets. And this is true in sports, in news, live music, entertainment, anything that, uh, anything that involves kind of a live atmosphere. So when you're thinking about an organization like the Red Sox or any type of photography, it's like, how do you keep it all organized? And this is something a lot of people struggle with. Um, so I'll give you kind of a, a behind the scenes look at, at what we do. 
we use a service called Photo Shelter, and Photo Shelter is basically an online archive, a cloud-based archive storage solution that you can access from anywhere that you have internet connection. So we store all of the photos that we shoot and edit in this archive called Photo Shelter, um, and we can access any photos at any time that we need to because we get tons of requests both internally and from external media partners. So we need a way to keep it all organized and access everything really quickly. And I'll play this little video here. So this kind of shows on the left here, we've got it you know, organized by year, um, you know, pretty much by season. Um, we started in 2002 and moved on from there. Um, and then within each season, we have it further broken down into categories. So events and appearances, fan photos, beauty shots of Fenway Park, our charitable foundation, game photos, pregame, and on and on. And every photo that we upload gets uploaded with a caption, a complete caption, and a detailed list of keywords so that we can find anything that we need to right away. So we can search for anything that we want to find, and it'll come up. So I searched for Xander Bogarts hitting a home run in 2018. I can type those in, and it'll bring up all those results. And then on the right-hand side there, you can see all the caption info, the keyword info. So another example, let's say I wanted to find, you know, beauty shot of, of Fenway Park from 2019. I can type in those credentials and it'll bring up all of our really nice pictures of Fenway, the stadium and so forth and so on. So organization and having a, a, a sensible storage um, workflow is, is a huge part of what we do, just given that, you know, we have so many photos uh, to, to go through over a hundred years of history in our archives. So a lot of questions I get are like, what makes a good photo? How do you make a good photo? And what are the ingredients that go into good photography, whether it's sports or otherwise? Um, and so I think really for me, how I break it down is there are three main factors you're looking for or three main ingredients, I guess you could say. And the first is a peak action moment. You're looking to slow down an entire sequence of, of human movement down into a single isolated instant that's frozen in time forever. And that's something that's not easy to do. Um, like I said, our cameras shoot at, at 14 frames a second. And so that really helps us to get moments like this when you know athletes are suspended in midair, um, a ball being suspended in midair, kind of having that illusion of, of floating, um, or you know these kind of collision, high impact plays, these moments on the field of play. Um, and so that's kind of like the obvious thing about sports photography that makes a great photo is a high impact action moment. But that's certainly true, but there's a lot more I think that, that goes into it. And I think as photographers, whether we use our cell phones or whether we you know, use high-end fancy cameras, we all appreciate good light and how the light works and how the light moves and changes the scene. Um, so, you know, I am always looking and surveying the light, seeing how it's working in my favor or working against me um, in order to make a better photo. Um, and, you know, I think in New England here in Boston, we're, we're lucky to have the changes of the season. So, you know, in summer, we get this really nice golden light. In winter, we kind of have this like muted tones, blue tones. Um, and as the seasons change, that's something that keeps me fresh because I'm always kind of chasing the light and, and how it's working um, in a natural level. And then, you know, I try and use the lighting to convey a, a mood or, or help portray an emotion or, or tell a story in a better way. And sometimes that's not all natural. Sometimes there is artificial ways to do that. Um, so this is kind of an example. This is kind of like a boring, you know, mundane kind of drab photo of a guy walking through a kind of nondescript hallway. Um, with the overhead lighting. But if I add in some strobes and some colored gels and some flash, I can turn what's otherwise a pretty, you know, boring scene into something that looks completely different and magical. Um, or you can use, you know, strobe lighting to help kind of add dimension to a scene. So this is a combination of natural sunlight streaks coming through the holes in the wall there with the addition of a strobe light hitting his face and kind of combining the two. In, in a seamless way or you know giving adding those strobes and gels in a studio setting um, to give you know depth to your subject and, and kind of make your subject really come alive. Um, so there's always uh, creative ways to use strobe lighting and studio lighting 
And then there's the other times where it just kind of happens all on its own. Mother nature kind of takes over. You get that late afternoon golden, golden hour that we all love so much. You know, those perfect kind of midsummer sunsets. Um, this is the stuff that I am chasing at all times. Um, so always just observing the light and how you can use it to benefit your photography. And then I think the third and final ingredient is the one that is perhaps the most important and the one that I really infuse into my work. And that is the human emotional element to photography. Um, you know, I think emotions are what bring your subjects to life and emotions are what we all love and can relate to when it comes to sports photography. And I think the best photo that you, you know, a photo that you remember or a photo that stands out in your mind is one that you made an emotional connection with as the viewer. And these are the, this is what we love about sports, the high, the high highs, the low lows, everything else in between. I feel like these are the images that kind of make us feel like we can relate, even if it's just for a second, brings us back to the time when we used to play sports growing up or watching your favorite team. This is the stuff that, um, you know, we all connect with when it, when it comes to sports. And you have to keep in mind, you know, you're certain, a lot of times you find yourself shooting athletes that are at the top of their craft, the ultimate pinnacle of sports. And these are people that put their entire lives and energy into their craft. And so when you get, you know, those moments of release, when you get that emotional release, you really have to capitalize on it. And that is oftentimes when it makes, you know, the, the great pictures. Um, so those are the three kind of things that I'm, that I'm always looking for. And I think that combination, no matter what type of photography you do, is a recipe for success. Couple quick kind of more technical tips, I guess, um, or, or tricks. I think the first is that because things are happening so fast in sports, you have to learn to kind of master the technical side of photography so that you're not even thinking when you're out there shooting, you're just reacting muscle memory and you can focus on what's happening in front of you and not necessarily focusing on your settings and adjusting to dial in to make sure you're, you're right. Um, when that decisive moment happens, you have to be ready and not fumbling around with your camera. So I think it all starts with kind of a, a basic understanding of the exposure triangle, learning your ISO, your shutter and your aperture and how they work in your favor. These are my general rules for sports photography. I keep the shutter speed on the higher side to avoid motion blur. Usually I'm around one one thousandth of a shutter speed. I don't go any lower than that unless I'm trying to intentionally blur the subject. Um, but a, a thousandth of a second is a good rule of thumb to freeze action and get nice, sharp, crisp images um, no matter how fast your subject is moving. ISO, I try and keep as low as you possibly can. Avoid kind of that grain and that digital noise. And that makes for nice, crisp, clean pictures and images um, with your files. And then aperture wide open as low as you can possibly go is my stylistic choice that gives you that really nice, um, you know, clean, blurry kind of dreamy background that you often see in sports photography. So just running through high shutter speed, that'll, that'll freeze the action for you in a great way. Um, low aperture, that gives you that really nice dreamy background, that bokeh, that blurred out kind of effect. And then ISO as low as you can go. Um, usually for a night game, I'm around 1600 at Fenway Park, but that varies um, depending on, on where you're at. And then some stylistic rules on, on how you know I shoot and how I think a lot of sports photographers shoot. Um, shooting clean is a term that a lot of photographers use in the sporting world. And it's kind of a funny word, but um, it's kind of a word to describe composition particularly when it comes to your background. So university, universally, you know, it's kind of agreed upon that the cleaner your background, the more impactful your image is going to be. Um, and that's, a, that's not a hard and fast rule, but anytime you can find a nice, clean, simple background, that's usually a choice that I consciously make and try and find. So whenever possible, I'm trying to avoid what I would call here is like a busy background. You know, you've got all I can really see when I look at this picture is the advertisement going across, you know, the looped in advertisement and the words. And I feel like that kind of distracts from the action that the guy is doing with the basketball. And I also feel like the referee's legs coming out of his legs between there, 
that is also a distraction. So really kind of like avoiding those elements at any times is something that I'm trying to do. Another example with this tennis shot um, from US Open, you got the ball boy kind of standing right there, right behind the subject. And that doesn't do you any favors as far as making your subject really stand out and really pop. You've also got that empty row of seats right there with only a couple fans. So if I were to recrop or re-edit this photo, I would probably just crop right to the blue there um, and cut out the fans and that'll make it cleaner. And, you know, one more kind of example, decent action shot as far as what's happening, um, but just kind of a messy background overall. You've got the building, the restroom sign behind. So really trying to eliminate, you know, these types of distractions, umbrellas, signs, people behind you. Um, the background is the first thing you're looking for when it comes to sports photography. And that's kind of counterintuitive to what you would think. You would think you need to look at the action first, what the subject is doing. But I always think the background is really what you want to look for first when sizing up any sort of photo. And then you can move on to your, to your subject. So this is kind of more along the lines of what I'm drawn to. Clean, um, you know, using the background to enhance your subject, enhance the story you're telling, rather than trying to um, have it compete with your subject. Horizon lines is a, is a good one and an easy one to fix. Obviously when sports photography, when sports are happening in front of your face, things are happening fast and you can't always get it perfectly right in camera. Um, but a lot of times a simple crop will go a long way. So just fixing that horizon so that you're not tilted will make you feel a lot more balanced as a viewer um, and just kind of have a more technically strong picture. So another thing I'm always looking for, again, this is something that happens really fast I can't shoot that perfectly straight in person, but I can always do a quick crop in Photoshop. There are times maybe when, uh, no, here we go, we'll move on here. Yeah, and there are times when maybe you don't wanna do that, but I think as a general rule, um, that's, always a, that's always a good, a good rule. And then I think you know, what separates great photographers in sports from good ones is that they're not just showing the action. I've talked about this before, but diversifying the tag, you are there, at a sporting event because you have access and you have a unique vision that only you can see that somebody who's watching on TV or somebody who's a fan at the game can't see. And so it's your responsibility to tell kind of the complete picture of the event, the complete picture of what's happening, not just the field of play, those moments before, emotional moments, behind the scenes moments, in the tunnel, in the locker room. In addition to shooting the action, you know, tight and close up, giving those more environmental looks that show kind of the scale of the stadium or event that you're at and really taking advantage and capitalizing on that intimate access that you have as a photojournalist or a sports photographer. And so these are all the, the principles and technical um, techniques that I try to apply wherever I am shooting. And I've been really lucky, you know, over my course of my career to um, see some really cool things for various, you know, clients um, on the editorial side, on the commercial side, you know, takes you to some really great places, meet uh, people and rub elbows with people that you never thought you would be um, in contact with. And so those are the kind of, um, that's the mentality that I, that I have, you know, when shooting. Um, so you're just kind of seeing some, some general examples here of, of the sports I've done from around the world for, for different clients here. It's a very cool profession, not something that I thought I would get into, um, but here we are. I'll do a quick five minutes or so on COVID and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap it up. Uh, this was wild for every industry. Uh, photography industry was hit just as hard as any other business you can think of. Um, everything completely shut down You know, for us. We were totally un uncertain if we would have a season at all, when we would be playing with fans. Um, you know, everything just stopped for a while and slowly but surely it started to come back. And, you know, we're at the point now where we're getting there. Um, but for a while, this is what sports photography looked like for, you know, people across the world. Um, the games happened under tight protocols, but no fans in the stadium, no field access, which is obviously something that as sports photographers we're all used to. Um, so that's definitely an adjustment, you know, shooting from the stand, shooting from far away and trying to figure out how to still make a good picture when you don't have any access. 
definitely a challenge. It was interesting that there were some sports that kind of continued on through the pandemic. Those individual sports like NASCAR actually kind of kept me busy through COVID. Um, just a person driving in a car, it's kind of those low contact sports. Um, and then there were some interesting stories too. This was a piece uh, that I did for the New York Times about the new rules governing high school soccer, about how you couldn't have any sort of physical contact within soccer and you had to keep your distance and how it totally changed the look and feel of the sport. Um, and it's also interesting that, you know, a lot of these places, you weren't even allowed to go into the stands. Like this is a New England Patriots game and they never let us up onto the crowd level. We always had to shoot from the field. Now with COVID, it was all of a sudden the reverse where we had to pee in the crowd uh, or in the seats and you couldn't be on the field. And so it was an opportunity to make some different pictures than you had done before. These are, this is a simple photo, but something that really no photographer has from the Patriots games for the past um, 10 years or so. And then you had to get really creative, you know, during the time where we didn't know what was going to happen, we weren't sure if we were going to have a season, but we still felt like we needed to produce content and make some cool, you know, photos. And I, so I got, you know, kind of creative and came up with this FaceTime portrait concept. So basically this is done all via cell phone, calling our players on FaceTime from wherever they were standing or wherever they were staying during the pandemic at their homes with their families, giving them a call and then kind of made this makeshift little studio right here in my living room with any Red Sox junk I could find around the house, balls, gloves, bats, um, posters, magazines, made this little studio and then would give the players a call and then physically put the phone into that little studio and direct them on posing for portraits through the phone. And then you're taking a picture of the phone in situation with the, with the studio. So, you know, nothing crazy here, but during the peak of the pandemic, this was kind of our reality. Um, we're all connected, but not physically, only through the screen. And so I think these will kind of stand the test of time as the pandemic portraits um, and the reality that it was for, for 2020. We played an entire 65 games through, through the pandemic with no fans in the States, in the seats. Um, so an entire season abbreviated, but an entire season with no fans. And so this was kind of the look this is kind of what it looked like, uh, you know, players against the empty Fenway. Those kind of images were the ones that were, you know, players in masks. That's what we were doing um, through 2020. This was our team photo, which was our, our socially distanced version of the team photo. Usually all the entire team is, you know, together, standing side by side, shoulder to shoulder. Obviously, we had to spread it out, keep the masks on. Not how the team photo should be done. But again, this will definitely be kind of a historic photo and our, our unique take on the, the COVID team photo. And then there was ways that we can kind of use technology to, to our advantage and, and really help out. Um, so what you're looking at here is a robotic camera from Nikon. Um, and this is a full 360 degree weatherproof camera that can go pan, tilt, and zoom in any direction. And it's all controlled via a tablet. So an iPad or a Surface Pro. Um, and you can control this camera from wherever you are. So you don't even have to be at the stadium if you don't want to. Um, and so what we did was we set up five of these cameras around the ballpark on the low levels of the field where we could strategically put a camera but not physically be because of the restrictions because of COVID. And this really gave us some incredible results. So all of these photos that you see here were taken by us but with these robotic cameras. Um, and just a little bit scary to think about the technology and how, uh, you know, you can get such great results from a machine, um, but also cool to embrace it and, and, you know, see how you can use it to your, to your advantage. So we had to get creative. Then this year, things are, you know, slowly started to come back. Um, at the beginning of the season, we started in 25% capacity. And then what we were saying before, it literally went up to 100% overnight. And so now we're fully back. Things are alive and well. Um, there's a lot of energy at the park. You know, we've got games going on full speed. This was just three days ago um, at Fenway. So, you know, we're kind of back and hopefully um, turning the corner of the pandemic and, and getting back to our, our normal that we all um, that we all know. So, you know, overall, it's been a great ride for me um, at, the, at the Sox. Ten years, I've witnessed two World Series championships. 
one in 2013 and then kind of seen the progression of an old guard of old players, David Ortiz's of the world into this new generation of young players winning another world series in 2018, going through a pandemic. And then here we are, what happens next is, is to be determined. Um, but that's kind of the general overview of what I do and how I shoot. And I hope you enjoyed this. And at this point, I'm happy to uh, open it up to, to any questions that we have. And these are my world series rings that I got from the, from the world series in <laughs> two years. I'll stop sharing the screen now. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Thank you. It's incredible. Thank you. The journey of what you did and everything. Wow. This is an experience that it's not easy to get from anyone. Indeed. Yes. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So one of the questions that came in, and it's actually from Marcos, um, do you... Do you study the team plays like if that they are usually like they are usually usually but to second base or third base or do you study will try to catch the other um, team singles if they're going to touch the ball? Yeah, that's a good question. Like you 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 do have to study the players' tendencies a little bit and where they tend to move and where they tend to hit the ball and that knowledge, you know, it is research and that that research definitely helps your success rate. Um, and yes, they, they do try and catch each other's signals. <laughs> That's definitely a part of the game. And so you're kind of trying to do that as well. Um, we're pretty much clueless when it comes to that stuff. But yeah, generally studying the players, the research into how they play the game is super beneficial, not just baseball, but any, any sport you're shooting. Good question. How do you connect the camera with your laptop? Yeah, so there's a couple ways that you can do it. Um, for a normal game that's not a super important game, just a regular old game on like a Tuesday night or whatever, um, I'll just do the old school way, which is just a card reader into the laptop and take the card out of the camera, put it into the card reader and ingest that way. Um, if we are in a high pressure game, like opening day or playoffs, World Series, something like that, um, we will tether directly from the camera to the computer. So. Uh, an ethernet cable into the camera and then into the computer on the other end. And then basically it's just FTPing the photos in as you're shooting. So you get the shot, you hit a button on the back of your camera and then that goes into an FTP where we'll then have somebody at the desk pulling the photos, doing the edits and then sending them out. So that's kind of our like a workflow. If it's a high profile event I mean, for a normal game, baseball is slow enough that you can just kind of use a card reader and just ingest the old school way, I guess. Um, you photograph, someone asked a question, I answered it, but um, you photograph mostly, 99% of the time you photograph the home games. When do you, when do you go away to, to photograph away games or obviously you do playoffs, but yeah. can you elaborate on that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I go probably to four or five road trips a year and that's, about maybe a little less than half of the trips that they do. And that's a conscious decision. I think if I wanted to go all the way, I could. It's more of just a lifestyle decision to not go, you know, just because you're never home and you, you never get a break. Um, but I'll go on like a trip that will have good potential for content. So like if it's a historic stadium that we're going to like a Wrigley Field in Chicago or Dodger Stadium in LA, those are the trips I like to go on because it's high profile, it's high energy, it's historic stadiums. Or if it's a city that offers something great for us to do, like for example, in Seattle, we went and we took one of our players up in a plane to fly around Mount Rainier. And we, you know, we shot that whole day. And so if it's a place like that, that has something cool to offer that the players might do that might make for great photos and video, that's usually a trip that I'll go on. Um, so that's kind of like how I decide, um, but as a conscious decision, 162 games a year, that's too many for me. So <laughs> I pick and choose my spots. Billy, one question. How do you focus? How do you work your focus? It's a pre-determined -determin focus that you, you have. You, how, how do you work? You, you focus? I mean, in sports photography, that's one of the things that I always consider that that it's genius how do you manage to get a, a perfect focus 
it's very difficult and takes a lot of practice. The first thing is just you have to repetition is is everything really in in photography in sports, you know, because you got to just do it and mess up and fail <laughs> hundreds of times before you get it right. Um, but yeah, pre focusing is a is a great technique. Um, so for example, if if you anticipate that there could potentially be a play at second base, for example, you can kind of pre focus on the base. And then, you know, if you need to pan there really quickly, you're already locked in right there. And that's a great way to increase the probability of getting a, a, a sharp photo. Um, other than that, I use the back button on the camera to focus. So that a lot of cameras have like a little button right where your thumb goes on the back. Yeah. And that helps. I'm just kind of pushing that down as I'm panning with the guy moving um, as they're moving. And that helps me kind of lock in and continue to lock in as they're moving up the line or as they're running across. And so that's like my technique. Um, and I, you know, I still mess, I still miss all the time. So it's just part of it. <laughs> Is you shooting uh, mostly at a, uh, at a wide open stop, F stop? I, I do, yes. Usually I'm at 2.8 or F4, yeah. And that makes it harder to focus for sure. Well, F4 for the F4 lessons, 2.8 for the F2 lens, for the F2.8 lenses. Correct, yeah, whatever I've got on me. You choose that to get the background out, right? Yeah, blur out the background and make your make your subjects feel kind of larger than life, you know, give them that really heroic kind of quality. But then you're at a distance, so that increases your depth of field to some degree. Right, totally. And a lot of times it's at a far distance, so it's not really, if you're at 2.8 or if you're at, you know, five, six, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference anyway. Do you uh, like that 400 lens? That's my favorite. That's my favorite. Yeah. Sharp and a two eight all the way through. So day game, night game, any sort of lighting condition, you get great stuff. What do you, uh, what do you do? What do you do in the off season? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> yeah. A lot of those, uh, nothing. I just hang out for three months. No, <laughs> <laughs> I, um, a lot of those events that you saw, um, the football, the hockey, ski jump, those all happen in the winter. So especially now, like the winter is just booked with stuff all, you know, um, November, December, January is all stuff at Fenway. And then it's also a lot of, um, you know, creative meetings, um, strategic meetings about what we're going to do for the next season and planning all that stuff out. And then, you know, February rolls around and I'm down in Florida for a month for spring training and February, March, and then the season starts April 1st and you're back. So um, there's a couple of weeks of downtime, but usually it still, you know, remains pretty busy. Oh, well, I, I actually have a couple other questions, but go ahead. You had a question, what were you gonna say for now? For now? That's it, only a couple of weeks, that's not much. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a lifestyle you, and that's, you kind of sign up for it. Um, you know, that's part of, that's part of the job. Um, so you do have to find ways to like manage that in the best way and make sure you're not just always working. <laughs> really, I need to ask you how, where are you in this picture? Okay. So that is in the middle of downtown Boston. Yeah, but but, where are you, you putting yourself? Lying on my back on the floor on the floor yeah lying on my back on the floor um because this event was happening in the middle of uh you know like a busy square in boston and the backgrounds are just very busy this is a lot of a lot of cars a lot of traffic you know buildings and it's just ugly and so that's the situation where i'm thinking okay i need to find a way to clean this up mm -hmm. and make it you know more impactful in the, the sky offers that so you, you said three things that i loved because i always uh, I, I tell my students uh lighting background and yep. the horizon exactly and they all went like yeah he told us <laughs> it's important those things are super important that's what makes great photos you know so so what's the difference of for, uh, a lot of the ours here based here in Florida, but what's the, when you go to spring training versus versus um, going to, you know, the season stuff, what's the experience like um, 
photographing in, a spr in spring training versus home games? Is there anything that's yeah. different or vibes about it? Or like, yeah, it's, it's funny. I think it's just like being down in Florida, like everything's much more like just chilled out. It's like a very relaxed vibe when we're there. Whereas up here, everything's very tense, very, very uh, stressful. And I think that's probably a product of like just being in the Northeast, you know? Um, and so the days are just very relaxed. You know, they work out early in the morning. Usually you're there at sunrise, kind of like, you know, 6 a.m. or so. And then everything's done kind of by noon or one o'clock. And then you just kind of hang out um, and, you're, and you're done for the day. Or you go catch up with the players, you know, they'll, they'll go fishing or, you know, go to the pool or whatever. So it's just, it's a much more relaxed vibe. Um, and it's a nice, nice way to kind of ease into the season, get warmed up, get your rhythms back as far as shooting and just get to know the players. That's the best time to really make those relationships. You may, you may, you may, you may not know this answer. So speaking of, um, you know, relaxing and stress, what when you photograph in Fenway, you photograph the games, what's the most is it what's the most um most interesting that you like to pho photograph or think? Is it is it a, a, a you know a, 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 a amazing home run, a, a, a bench clearing draw, or um what, I mean or you know um a winning run? What's the most what's the most best thing you like to photograph or most stressful thing to photograph? I think my favorite thing is like the, the like a dramatic game winning walk off you know home run or celebration on the field because you you don't know how it's going to play out like he could hit a home run and run around the bases or he could hit a double and then all the players come and rock, mob him in the outfield you don't know where it's going to happen so that's exciting to me like you, you know you know you're going to get a great picture but you don't know how it's going to play out so I think I like that the most and that is also the thing that stressed me out the most like early on because I'm like so nervous to miss. And now I don't, I don't get stressed about it because if you miss, you miss, that's life. <laughs> but I think that's like my favorite thing to do. Yeah. People, do in, anyone? In the off season, you're, you're, you're shooting around between, uh, up to 12 o'clock, between 10 to 12, you have the high sun and the harsh light. How do you manage that? Yeah, it's tough. It's really tough. Um, the one o'clock games are not great um, for, for, for that. And there isn't really a way to manage. Honestly, you just the pictures aren't as good, I think. And, and also, you take advantage of that time to do different stuff, you know, stadium stuff or fan stuff. And, and you know, you don't really use that time to get like your stock photos of the players, you know, um, usually I'll wait for like a, a nice overcast day to get that stuff or a four o'clock game or night game. And then you can kind of get that stock, but you do have to manage that. And it is tough in, in the full sunlight for sure. Okay. Guys, I don't know if anyone has another question before we say one, one more thing on the, uh, on the night game where you have the stadium lights, do those provide you enough light uh, for you to, uh, uh, to use a low ISO? At Fenway, yes. Um, I'm at about 1,600 or 2,000 ISO at a night game. But other stadiums, some of them are really bad. You know, some of them you have to go up to 5,000, 6,000 and above. Wow. Also, like if you go, if you shoot, you know, high school or college sports, a lot of those stadiums, like it's tough. The lighting's tough. They don't have, you know, bright lights on the field or you're in a high school gym and it's poorly lit. So, um, that can be where it gets to be a little bit more difficult, but we're, uh, we're lucky. The D4 and the, D, the D5 and the D6, you, they handle the ISO pretty well? D5 really does, yeah. D5 and 6 really do. Really good job. Compared to the D850, better? D850 is great, too. It's just not as fast. Right. So. Same camera. Right. Great camera. Okay. People. This is for you. <laughs> we really appreciate it. Like I said, this is for, I'm sure I'm talking in the name of, of all, my, all, all the people here. 
this is a live experience. Uh, I think that I felt like well, I wasn't steady with you. I enjoyed very much. I, I cannot address more like thank you very much. It's been an honor to have you today with us. Likewise. There was one, there was one question just there was one question that just came in. I don't know if we, maybe if you should address it real quick, but um, are your pictures of the plays used on, used on baseball cards? Uh, yes, they are. Um, we file, I send some of my images to Getty Images um, and that's where they get picked up for baseball cards. So baseball card companies will license the photos through Getty Images uh, and then put them on the cards. So there, I do have a little collection of photos that have been on baseball cards from through, through the years. So kind of a cool thing. Very cool. Cool. Billy, next time you'll be in Miami, you're going to have like 23 or 25 invitations. I appreciate it. With you. I appreciate it. Thank you all for joining. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you. Have a good night. Gary, send me your phone number. Okay, I will. I'll email to you. All right. Thank you. Good night. Good night.